Our journey goes back over 20 years when a group of 7th grade students from Golden Gate Middle School, aided by social studies teacher David Bell and art teacher Michelle Lee, decided the story of the Holocaust was too important to be confined to a few lessons in a school classroom. The more the students learned, the more they wanted to share that learning with others, and the idea of a museum began to take shape. A grant from the Jewish Federation in Collier County helped Bell develop the Classroom Museum out of the ashes. The involvement of Homer Helter, collector of World War II memorabilia, expanded the collection and exhibits at Collier County Historical Museum and Florida Gulf Coast University brought the students' work before a larger audience. Donations came in and out of the ashes moved to a storefront in Tanglewood Shopping Center. In the fall of 2000, Ann Jacobson, who was to become the first president, created a steering committee of community leaders to establish a Holocaust museum. Laurie Mayer, the museum's first curator, started to train docents and with others developed a docent guide. In November, Adassa Schulman was employed as part-time museum coordinator. A 2002 grant developed teaching materials and also funded the publication of this memoir by Holocaust survivor Abe Price. In 2003, the museum moved to its first permanent location in Sandalwood Square and began to offer educational programs to help meet the Florida state mandate to teach about the Holocaust in public schools. Amy Masira was recruited as Education Outreach Coordinator. In the museum, in our classroom, and through outreach, from an initial 5,000, an average of 15,000 students a year in different age groups have learned about the people and events of the Holocaust and the important lessons this history has for each of us today. In 2005, the museum launched the Oral Visual History Project to preserve the testimonies of those individuals in southwest Florida who personally observed and experienced the evils of the Holocaust so that future generations would know what happened. It was pretty much isolation in school. Um, every day opened with the singing of the uh, Nazi anthem. So he got out and he said, this is it. He, the, he said, whatever anybody believes or does not believe about the Nazis, they are going to kill us. Probably the most humiliating thing that we had to do. Everybody from the time you were six years old and up had to wear a Jewish star on the left side. It had to be sewn on every garment that you had. The Nazis would come and check at the convent periodically because I think they might have been aware of the fact that some of the convents were hiding Jewish children. What happened, they had broken into the house in the middle of the night. Somebody had given us away and uh, we were taken to the prison. In the summer of 1943, they rounded up a lot of the other Jews and we were rounded up with them. And again, uh, the, and we ended up in Westerbork which was a Dutch transit camp. He held out his fingers like this, you know. I'll never forget an event like this. You go here, you go here, you go here. Everybody got like a, a number which we had to have hanging on our neck. It was a name of the transport and your number. Everybody got a number and from that time on we didn't have names and we had numbers. They used target practice on babies and pregnant women. I'll never forget it. The testimonies of Holocaust survivors and camp liberators like these have enriched and enhanced our stated mission. Hearing in person the stories of those who were victims and upstanders has given countless students the opportunity to learn about mutual respect and the dangers of indifference. I want you to know one thing. If somebody will ever tell you Holocaust never happened, 
it did happen, okay? I was there. I have my number on my arm. I was there. In 2007, past President Jack Nortman fulfilled a long-held dream of bringing a World War II boxcar from Europe to the museum in Naples. The boxcar had to be transported from Vienna to Rotterdam by truck, but the initial route had to be changed when it was discovered it was too tall to pass under certain bridges. It was loaded onto a freighter in Rotterdam and the voyage to Miami took about six weeks. Nordman was there to witness its arrival. And my mother says that she was on that side in the car. State troopers and local police escorted the boxcar along Alligator Alley and the Tamiami Trail to be greeted by staff, volunteers and Holocaust survivors at the museum in Naples. Officially dedicated a year later, it became the world's only traveling boxcar exhibit. The boxcar has made a huge impact um, in all aspects of education at the Holocaust Museum. And um, it's a program that was very difficult to put together because how do you figure out how to take a 10 ton <laughs> antique boxcar around southwest Florida? And honestly, it was not a project that I wanted to do um, when it first started. And now I can't imagine not doing it. It's been one of the biggest highlights of our educational programming. In 2008, we launched Triumph, awards and celebration for people and deeds of inspiration. The first recipients were ABC's news anchor Bob Woodruff and his wife Lee, and TV broadcaster and camp liberator Peter Thomas. The following year honoured Henri Landworth, who spent five years in Nazi camps and later founded the Give Kids the World Village in Central Florida. In 2010, we honoured 1936 Olympian Jesse Owens with an award to his granddaughter Marlena Dorch. To celebrate the museum's 10th anniversary, Collier County students created artwork based on an inspirational quote from Anne Frank. 2012 saw a live art and musical performance by Colombian artist Juan Diaz. His light wall told the story of two girls from different backgrounds whose friendship was torn apart by hate. The following year honoured retired general and Holocaust survivor Sidney Schachnau and the museum's own Anne Jacobson and Laurie Mayer. In March 2014, the museum honoured veterans of the Ghost Army and local cadet Schaefer McHenry, who'd formed a disability friendship circle. Dearest Pauline was a dramatic multimedia presentation. Guests were transported into the life of Dr. Price Duff through wartime letters to his wife and daughters. For the 15th anniversary triumph, Rose, Jack and Effie Nortman were honored for their extraordinary efforts to bring a World War II boxcar from Vienna to Naples. The following year saw an inspirational presentation by the author and teacher who used the Holocaust as a lesson to teach unteachable students to be humane, noble and just. In this triumph, David, grandson of President Eisenhower, was the featured guest and Golden Gate Middle School Out of the Ashes creators Michelle Lee and David Bell received a 20th anniversary award. In 2019, there is life after hate was the message from former neo-Nazi skinhead Christian Picciolini who turned his life around. The following year, 
Dr. Ruth told Rabbi Miller about her wartime experiences. And then there was a nurse who said, a girl cannot be here with all the boys. Stupid. We couldn't have done anything. My two feet were bandaged. I was on that shelf. But I found a way. There was a good looking, very good looking medical student. I made believe that I couldn't eat. Nonsense. My hands were perfect, you're right. He had to come and feed me three times a day. <laughs> and for our 2021 triumph, we went virtual with an evening of hopeful inspiration with Stephen Smith from the Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles. <music> Running alongside the Triumph celebrations from 2014 were the annual fundraising luncheons, originally ladies' luncheons, which began with an event using recipes from the Holocaust Survivor Cookbook at the home of board member and museum supporter Maureen Lona. Breakfast at Tiffany's was the story of Audrey Hepburn's teenage years in Holland during World War II with author Margaret Cardillo. Curious George was the story behind the story of that curious little monkey with author Louise Borden. In Flight, a professionally written and acted play told the story of Sabine Van Damme's flight from Nazis and their collaborators. You know how much money I'll get if I tell everyone there's a Jewish family hiding in this house. We aren't Jewish, sir. But Mama, you said... No. You look Jewish to me. And there's no place for Jewish <gasps> filth in this town. And that's why they're paying good, responsible people to clean it up. Violins of Hope, celebrating the gripping and inspirational stories of restored violins played by Jewish musicians during the Holocaust. Music of hope and remembrance inspired by the imprisoned musicians and chorus members who performed the Verdi Requiem in the Theresienstadt Ghetto in 1944. The Rescue, the powerful story of a courageous diplomat from El Salvador who saved thousands of European Jews during World War II. When we were liberated by the Russians, we eventually, in, at the end of May, we were turned over to the Americans and ended up in DP camp temporarily. And even there, when my father showed him our papers with the citizenship, the American person in charge said, well, you're an American. And allowed us to go into town, gave us freedom. Even in a DP camp, we were not stuck in a DP camp. We always ask of any direct survivor is, if my grandfather, Colonel Castellanos, was speaking to you right now, what would you say to him? The bottom line is, if it weren't for him, we would not be alive. And for our 20th anniversary, a new play about Holocaust survivor and museum co-founder, Abe Price. In 2016, Laurie Mayer's 15 years of tireless work at the museum was honored with a Point of Light Award. In 1993, former President George H.W. Bush submitted a report highlighting the importance of volunteers. He called them points of light, and since 1998, more than 5,000 honorees have been named. But before that, with growing numbers of daily visitors and often uncomfortably large school groups, a $3.5 million capital campaign was launched for the purchase of a new building. In March 2018, the museum received a pledge of $1 million from Janet Cohen towards the campaign, and the 6,000 square foot building on Imperial Golf Course Boulevard was named in honor of Janet and her late husband, Harvey D. But Laurie was not to see it, for on December the 1st, 2018, she passed away in Chicago, aged 91. But even on her last day at the museum, she captivated a crowd. The museum is here mainly to teach people, but also to dissuade people from denying that the Hollows ever happened.
Sunday, November the 10th, 2019, saw the grand opening of the new museum. There are so many special guests here with us today. First and foremost, Janet Cohen. This building carries her name in recognition of her tremendous generosity and strong belief in our mission, the importance of Holocaust education, and teaching mutual respect. Today, I'm just going to say how heartfelt it is to have you all here and to see this wonderful building and project beginning. Just let it go on and on forever. Um, thank you all for being here. We are going to do the ribbon cutting right in front of this planter box. I would like to ask our current board members, Holocaust survivors, any former board chairs who would like to make their way and join us. And we thank the Chamber of Commerce of Greater Naples for their help with it. One, two, three. This new Holocaust Museum and Cohen Education Center will challenge our community to learn from the past, learn from our failures, and take responsibility for our future. Following the ribbon cutting ceremony, I hope you will have time to take a walk through our museum. But more importantly, I invite you and encourage you to return for a docent-led tour in the hopes that you find our mission, take action against bigotry, hatred, and violence, something worthy of your support. Again, I want to thank you for being here today to celebrate this long-awaited moment with us. Thank you.